I want to get started and introduce our speaker, Hannah Sander, who's been a me member of this club for a long, long time. He's also the, the member that's like the farthest away from Barry. He lives in New Zealand. So, okay. So let, let's get a big round of applause for, for Hannah. several books that are sort of related to robotics. So I was a big fan of the um, multi-core propeller chip for Parallax. So I helped write a book there and um, wrote about my experience with the dance bot, which was a vision-guided balancing robot that I developed. And also the advanced control logic book that's coming up by Electar um, Circuit Seller um, relatively soon, hopefully. And um, I've um, come here a couple of times to talk about my products, um, 12 blocks and viewport and prop scope. Um, I'll cover, briefly cover those. And consulted on a diff couple different projects. And I wanted to share some of those stories of um, what robots are doing on the field and how I've been involved in some of those stories there. And um, I have a couple kids, an eight-year-old and a nine-year-old, and so I spend a lot of time these days in schools and um, trying to motivate kids to be excited about STEM subjects. So with Viewport, um, that was an IDE for, for the Parallax Propeller, and its um, core is a visual debugging engine. Um, so the, it is a great pointing and stepping line by line as your robot is doing real-time activities and graphing to see what's really going on. And that's been used um, by a company in Switzerland on an eight megawatt resolver. So it's this um, disc that spins around and they're trying to get some telemetry of that. And they used a parallax propeller and then viewport to diagnose that system. Um, there's also a company that is building um, telescope mounts, so really high-end telescope mounts for universities, and so there's um, a couple dozen of these out there, and the interface to the user is um, viewport. Um, so there's a propeller running, and there's actually two propellers, and they use viewport to make sure that all the fit constants are okay and that they're um, tracking the stars accurately. So on the bottom there is a little picture of some nebula that they took. Um, some more fun projects. Um, so some guy built a real Turing machine. Um, obviously not with an infinite tape, but um, still a um, nice device for a computer scientist. Um, and they used um, viewport to help debug that. And another guy um, built a home-built CNC machine, um, also powered with a propeller and viewport. Um, PropScope um, is an actual hardware device, so it looks like this, a couple BNC plugs on it, and it's a um, really good starter oscilloscope um, that I helped build for Parallax, and um, it's a two-channel 25 mega sample USB scope, so you just plug it into your USB on your laptop, and then you can measure it, um, all sorts of analog signals, and also generate all sorts of analog signals. So you can um, take a sample, email it to your buddy, and then they can generate that, so that sample. It also has a digital analyzer and a bunch of other good stuff. And that's been a bestseller at Parallax for the last two years. It's widely used in 
colleges and um, university schools, and I also help customize it for the automotive industry. Um, so um, taking it and adding some software to allow mechanics to diagnose problems with cars. Um, this is sort of a slide that I start off with when I go to schools, and I ask them, what, what is a robot? And um, this is sort of a robot that I grew up on, um, Rosie from the Jetsons. And um, here you can see the mechanics, the power source is somewhere inside her, might be nuclear. Um, sensors, so humans have five or six or seven or a dozen, depending on how you count. Um, and robots obviously can have all sorts of wonderful sensors. Um, actuators, and then what's interesting, what really makes it interesting is the programmable computer inside, um, sort of brain. And that brain can get input from humans as well, so it can be controlled. And I typically ask them, okay, so this is a list of what a robot is. How are humans different from a robot? And when it comes to programming robots, um, I um, sort of saw some of the software that was out there, um, especially Scratch, um, a little bit, the Lego Mindstorm, um, and the visual tools that have been developed over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. And um, from that, I came up with my own version of a robot um, programming language, which I call 12 blocks. Um, it's sort of the idea that a typical program that a student would write for a moderately complex um, robot would take about 12 blocks. So there's a lot of functionality um, behind the scenes in each one of those blocks. And um, so just some of these that are on here, um, down here in the bottom is going to play some music. And when you click on any one of these yellow regions, you get a wizard, so this one will give you a keyboard, and then you can click the right keys and come up with a melody. Um, and some other ones, um, so comments are in here, and this is a repeat three times. Um, up here, so some of these robots have the little LCD screens, and Rather than you programming some binary code, it gives you a visual editor where you have some um, tools to draw circles and squares and boxes, and um, it shows you right in your program what the what the robot is going to show. Um, and for movement, you get arrows telling them where the robot is going to go. So all relatively easy for. Um, kids to understand, and for adults like myself, if I'm just looking at the program for the first time in a couple of months, for me to see what the robot will do. And um, 12 blocks um, seems to be quite easy to use, so five, six-year-olds are using it, but it still has lots of powerful editing features. So there's a lot of um, drag and drop type of interfaces out there now. Um, but 12 blocks is still the only one where you can multiple select lots of blocks and control and paste, <coughs> copy and paste and um, undo and you have all these very powerful <coughs> wizard type blocks. You have all sorts of functions and um, tools to make all of that easy. So it's a very um, sophisticated visual programming interface. And it supports all sorts of popular robots, um, ranging from the Lego Mindstorm um, to the SD Bot um, to uh, an Arduino based T Bot to the Propeller based T Bot. So there's a whole lot of things out there. Um, I ask kids, why, why are robots interesting to you? So, robots, the word has been around for thousands of years. Um, it's not a Silicon Valley 10-year-old technology. It's something that's been around for a long, long time. And the cool thing about robots is that they work in difficult places. So um, if I have a kid, that's um, typically, they don't want to make their bed. And so they want to make a machine that makes a bed for them. Um, they can do things that humans can't. They can do some things better than humans, maybe faster, maybe safer, maybe more accurately. They can assist humans. And here was a video of a Curiosity rover on Mars. So um, it's quite amazing that we send something far away, and um, it's quite autonomous um, because of the time lag 
from here to Mars and back. Um, it could do a whole lot of things without our input. Robots come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. So as you're seeing here at HPRC, some are very small, some are sort of life-size. Curiosity is the size of a car. Um, and currently, they're not as general purpose as Rosie from the Jetsons. And so they're typically built for one purpose. Um, I like to say that a washing machine in everybody's house is a good example of a robot. It has a power source, it has actuators, it has sensors, it has some intelligence. They're getting more intelligence over time. Hello? Oh, we all have to move our hands. We're here. This happens at the age Okay. Okay, um, I'll just keep going. So, when I talk to kids, I ask them, is there a robot in your home? And at the beginning they say no, but after a while we come up with different examples of, yes, there is a robot in my home. And um, I think there's many different types of robots. I've been involved in some flying robots, um, drones, and they're quite popular in the news right now. Um, they seem to be hovering over everybody's house. And the cool thing about drones and flying robots is that um, they are way up high in the air. And it's quite efficient for them to go from one place to another very quickly. And they give you a new perspective on things. And drones typically combine sensors, so the gyroscope, accelerometer, GPS, barometer, um, with human input. So humans can give them waypoints to go around. and then the drone combines that internally and then solves a problem that the human operator wants to solve. And um, just in the last couple of months, I've been um, getting more involved in rafting. So New Zealand has all sorts of wonderful rivers to go down. And here's a picture that I took um, from the sky of me and my friends getting ready to raft this rapid here. And the um, Quadcopter um, has GPS and barometer, so it can stay in one place. I can park it there, and then it has a um, steady cam like camera um, mount that keeps the camera very steady. And so I can park that over a rapid and then go down the rapid um, with my friends and get some pictures and video from that. But I've also worked on an application, um, New Zealand's um, very much known for sheep, um, but recently that's changed more to cows. Um, so a big um, demand from China to pour milk over their cereal. And so um, there's a lot of demand in New Zealand to see how we can put more cows on our green pastures. And um, this application I was working on for this company was to see if we could fly a quadcopter over a pasture in some sort of pattern and with an infrared camera see how much grass, how much um, biomass was available for the cows to eat. Um, and so we're still working on that. And here's a little video of this quadcopter which is hard to see there but you can see it there. And it's flying and going up into the sky. So it's probably about the size. Yeah. Okay. Um, so they can fly, um, robots can also walk. So cars and bicycles and scooters and skateboards, they all have wheels on them. And um, the wheel was invented relatively recently. Um, evolution evolved the, the set of legs um, a long time ago. So insects and everything around us has legs. And it did that because the typical forest or the typical landscape has all sorts of obstacles that would prevent wheels from going over those obstacles. And with a set of legs, um, you can do more interesting movements than you can with just wheels. Um, I started with a dance bot robot, and so a leg-based robot um, could give me more freedom to express um, certain types of dances. So inside of 12 blocks, there is a simulator, and it can simulate sort of this hexabot style robot, and the types of blocks that would be interesting for this program would be something like this. So set the left tripod, so there's 
three sets, there's two sets of tripod, the left side and the right side, and you can set um, one of those, um, one of those, um, either the knee, the ankle, or the hip, to a set number, and then once you've chained up a number of those um, targets, then you can achieve that over a set amount of time. And so, with about a dozen of those blocks, um, you can get a hexabot with 18 servos um, to move a simulation and then to move in real life. And so here's um, this hexabot in my office. So um, it's, it's quite a big thing, quite heavy, so that's the best we'll do for now. Um, Robots have legs, um, they can also have arms. Um, so last year here at the HPRC, I had a human-like arm. So it had a uh, five degrees of motion, I believe. I had, it, it could turn around its axis. It had one um, arm here, another elbow, and then one over here and a grubber. And what I showed at HPRC was using this software tool built into Dropbox. Um, frame by frame, I got the arm to go at different poses and then pick up a pencil and move the pencil over a table and let go. And once I had programmed that, then I let it run autonomously and move pencils over and over again. So um, that's what I used to do there. And since then, I've added this SCARA-style programming. So a human-style robot um, is, is good for recreating human movement. But if you're doing pick and place, um, which is what you would typically do in a factory, you want something that's very precise and can move very quickly. And the type of robot arm that's very successful there is um, SCARA. And um, what you try to do is you try to keep the um, X, Y movement, um, quite quick and very precise. And so there's two um, separate motors responsible for that. And then there's one more that moves the entire stage up and down. And so I, uh, I'm exploring a business venture with a Chinese company to take this SCARA um, robot um, in my office, which is programmed by 12 blocks or in, um, Android interface um, for use in small scale manufacturing. Um, so relatively easy to program with 12 blocks where you want things to go, and then um, it goes about that. So here's this guy moving, sort of moving there and then shaking back and forth a little bit. Um, so that's a robot arm. Um, and um, robots that teach. So um, yeah, we've, we've all met people that think that math is hard, some people think it's easy, but there's concepts in the STEM subjects that can be quite hard to understand. And when you play with something, when you play with a toy, when you play with a robot, um, students can learn from them, but they can also apply knowledge that they've learned previously in a lesson and from a book. Um, and so that's very successful in schools. And I've been running robot workshops, um, classes, and competitive teams for the last five years. So I've been getting some experience on that, and I'm now taking that and um, trying to help other teachers be successful with that as well. Um, and one thing that I've done there is partner with a company called Cognition, and we're working with Lego and um, Spectrum to distribute a software into schools that works with the existing Lego Mindstorm sets that the school has bought, have bought. And this is a simulated environment that is programmed with 12 blocks. And um, the Lego Mindstorm is constructed in that simulated world. All the physics rules apply. Those physics rules can be modified. So one challenge is to do something on an Earth-sized planet. But they can also say, well, now you're on Mars. Um, what, how would your Lego Mindstorm robot behave on Mars? Um, and um, 
Yeah, so we've been selling this into schools for about a year now. Um, here's a really short overview of that. The STEM Virtual Robotic Toolkit provides classroom tools for design process and problem-solving inquiry. Designed for use with the LEGO Mindstorms NXT. Use STEM's robot simulator and programming environment to teach students problem-solving, creativity, and teamwork. You don't need 30 real robots to have all students participating. The STEM Virtual Robotic Toolkit allows all students to be actively involved. Simulated robots don't break, don't need batteries, and are never missing parts. Perfect your programs on the simulated robot, then run the exact same code on the real thing. Okay, um, so that's something I've been doing recently. And one thing that they do with that, so it's a kit that comes with the programming language, the simulator, and a whole lot of tutorials and um, curriculum for the teacher to come up with challenges and exercises for the kids to try to explore different concepts and learn from that. And one of those is um, sumo bots. Um, some of us have seen sumo wrestlers and it's the same sort of challenge. So there's um, two robots and an arena, a circular arena, and they try to push each other out of that arena. And what the students do here is that they program one of those robots um, using sensor inputs, using random numbers, and they come up with a program that they um, upload to either a virtual simulated Lego Mindstorm robot or a real robot. <coughs> and then they have a second Lego Mindstorm robot and they control that manually. And um, then they can pit a, their friends against their robot and then they can pit the best um, automatic robots against each other. And so here's a little video of what that looks like. Our sample code uses random numbers to calculate the angle and duration of the tax. This makes it harder to beat since the robot is so unpredictable. The code we've provided here is pretty complex and it can be modified for learners of any level. They push each other around and then once someone wins, they do a victory dance. Here we go. Yay! Score one in the computer. One more project I'm doing right now is a kayak jet. So in New Zealand there's um, lots of nice beaches and um, rivers and um, water to explore. And I have a kayak and myself, I'm not terribly athletic and my kid's a little bit too young and my wife isn't um, super powerful. But um, I found a 2400 watt brushless motor and a couple other components are sort of the size of my hand, so not terribly but large. And um, I've run it at 100 watts, as you can see in the, in the video there. And at 100 watts, it's pretty good. Um, 500 watts, um, I think it'll go quite good. So 500 watts is roughly a horsepower, and that's a lot more power than I have in me. And 500 watt LiPo battery, um, yeah, fifty hundred dollars pound, couple pounds. So relatively light, relatively easy to carry around. It's not a big lead acid battery anymore. It's not a big smelly tank of gas. It's just something that you can slip on there and um, go cruising around. Um, and all of this is sort of remote control RC technology, sort of robot technology. So I think it's should be relatively easy to convert to a automatic boat. Um, currently, it just tracks how much power it's outputting and battery capacity and that sort of stuff. But um, should be possible for me to um, maybe go with a kayak somewhere and then tell it to go back to the starting position and while I walk the path back to where I came from. But we'll see. Maybe it'll make its way all the way to Santa Cruz. <laughs> I'll have to pick it up from here. And with that, um, here's a little video. This is going up against the current, so. so I know it is. Sounds along. All right. Any questions? Yep. Is it running purple right here or in water? 
Um, the propeller is underwater, um, so it's a brushless motor and it's mounted under the boat and it's pushing water. Brushless means that even if water does get into it, it shouldn't harm anything. All the um, fancy electronics are in the air above it, unlike a brush motor where you have a commutator and all that in the water. Um, and it's a 2400 watt motor because that's the first motor that has a very low um, KV constant, so it has a lot of torque. Okay. And, and, and total cost for something like that is $100. So motor and controller and everything else. 500 watt hour sounds like a pretty large type of battery. Yes, it is. And um, pushing a kayak for an hour at a horsepower requires a pretty good sized battery. If you don't want to go that far, if you just want to go for 15 minutes, then you can cut it down. Or if you don't want to go that fast, 100 watt hour is uh, a lot less. But yeah, it's it's decent size. I have two hundred one hour. There's ten amp hour batteries out there and a couple of us series. <coughs> So it's been three years since our big earthquake. We had a 6.9 earthquake um, three years ago, and um, unlike um, Loma Prieta, we had 180 people die and $30 billion worth of damage. We were in the news for three weeks or so, and then Fukushima um, happened. So, um, But club is very much alive, um, Kiwi bots. We've had um, one member come, I forget who it was. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, me. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'm so happy to hear you. Thank you. You guys have been great to have you. Oh, I love Kana. Yep. I was actually in Boston this year for another conference. Talk about it. Okay. Yeah, so I'm just curious if uh, you saw the project Zoom launch or if I had anything to do with it. Um, I, I saw the news about it, and a, another friend of mine does something similar where he sends up weather balloons up to the edge of space, um, and instead of having a Wi-Fi net below them, he has a foam airplane with a GPS receiver in there, and the only control is a rudder, um, but so it takes some um, two or three hours to go from ground level to edge of space. And once it's up there, um, it might be blown off course by a thousand miles, right? So a jet stream, thousand miles per hour, if you're sitting in that area for a while, you might be um, from here to LA or, or further away. And if all you do is drop your thousand dollar metrological sampling or scientific sampling data, if you drop that straight down, you're gonna to have to go quite a ways or swim quite a ways to collect it. But if you have just a rudder and some sort of sail, some sort of plane that can soar a little bit, if you're up 20 kilometers, you can go quite a ways back. Um, or if you're um, a little fancier and you've programmed in alternate landing sites, then instead of landing way out in the ocean, you can land next to your friend's house and um, a couple hours later, Tell your friend, hey, there's a plane circling above your house. Can you pick that up and send it back to me? <laughs> so that's his business. Yeah? As a customer here, as I started playing with a propeller chip, it's a pretty complicated chip because it's got eight microprocessors on it. And this viewport that he has, you just keep discovering new things that it allow you to do. And so if you get interested in the propeller chip, treat yourself to viewport, and you can just assemble uh, what you can set up, just a uh, portable computer, and uh, a few pieces of parts of the color chip on the desk, you know, hold it all the lab. It's a great product. And good support, by the way, too, I'd like to say. What's your name? Sorry, you I'm George. George. You're going to George Taylor. Ah, okay. Now, you know, and the fact is, you know, that far away, usually I get about 24 hour turnaround on the Something that's happened or whatever. I think a great support. Thank you very much. Any 
further questions? I, I have one quick question. Um, a, lot, a few meetings back, you brought the little T-bots. Are they still on the market, or have they sort of faded out? Um, so the T-bot, my um, the manufacturing partner here in America, um, was out at Maker's Fair with me. Okay. And that was the first time that um, we met in the real world. And um, at that point, we had made um, about 100, and we had just made another 100. Okay. And then when I flew back to New Zealand and he flew back to Indiana, a couple weeks later, I got an email, um, sorry, I'll be gone for a while. And then six months later, I figured out that um, he was admitted to a mental hospital. And, uh, um, so I'm now working with a Chinese company, and we have the Arduino based team out um, And we're getting pretty close to that. So, it's so are you going to do a Kickstarter? Possibly. Okay. okay. So, uh, any further questions? Okay. Who's the uh, KV and the uh, voltage you ran on your uh, kayak? The KV was 100, which means that at 40 volts, um, it's only spinning 4,000 RPM. Or um, I was running it there at 10 volts, so it's only spinning at 1,000 RPM. So uh, in water, that's quite reasonable. And um, spinning a normal air propeller, glass-filled nylon, so relatively inexpensive but, and very, very efficient. A lot of the marine type screws are very inefficient but um, are very um, resistant to breaking when you run into rocks or other things. Yeah. Uh, how did you make the grasses made of the rocks? How did I make the, the grass estimation? Yeah. yeah. Um, so that wasn't my part as much. Um, and that's so. What what they were doing is flying an infrared camera and a visual camera over fields. And so by looking at the different spectrums, and the, they could they had some estimate. So they they calibrated that and they <coughs> saw how green and how it looked in infrared spectrum, and then they used that data to see how much was out there. Um, that part is, is very, very low-tech currently, so currently um, um, it's, it's very nice for farmers to know how many cows they can put on the field and being off by 10% means they either lose 10% profit or 10% of their cows go hungry. Um, and the best way that they can gauge how much grass is out there is to literally look. Um, and, and, and hope for the best. And they have some things where they sort of put a circular disc on some grass and see how much it sinks down, and then they can measure individual pieces of grass. So not much better than we could do a thousand years ago. Didn't you help in the American Cup race? Uh, I, I had the picture in there. I mean, so. I, um, I'm, a, I'm a very patriotic Kiwi, and we're following the America's Cup race, the sailing race, very closely up to the point where it was a foregone co conclusion that we would win. It was 8-0, I think it was, and I don't want to know what happened after that. <laughs> um, there's no way they could have come back. Um, but um, yeah, so I was up at Auckland um, for a while and um, did a bit of consulting with them. And actually on the, not, not the racing boats, on the racing boats, they weren't allowed that sort of technology, but on the training boats, they had a whole bunch of propellers, all of them, so not, um, not propellers, but the propeller chip. And that was taking in data and all sorts of telemetry. And then after each um, race, they could see how the boat did and um, in the current wind condition, in the current um, water condition, and see how it should have performed. Um, and get data from there. Yeah. I'm just curious, if you were to put a percentage on it, what, what would you say that percentage of autonomy on that boat? Because they pretty much sailed itself for itself. <laughs> um, so sort of completely unsailable uh, for, for normal mortals. Um, 
And so once they finish those races, they're taken apart for scrap because you can't do anything with them. I mean, the ones from a couple dozen years ago, those are still saleable and, and they're, they're, they're okay. But they're so high tech these days and it requires such a large, very, very um, skilled team that, um, yeah. But um, the, 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 the actual ones that go out there, everything is done by, by, by humans. So they are flying above the water, but there is a guy who trims the, I forget the names of the jib sheets or whatever, to make them fly above water. So 100% human. Any further questions? If not, I'd like to thank our speaker.